Hello again, everybody. Welcome back to Dark Souls 3. Today, we're gonna go through Farron Keep. It is, uh, it's an area that, um, reading the SA thread of Dark Souls 3 shortly after its release, many people seem to hate this area because it reminds them of other areas they don't like, such as the Valley of Defilement. Or Valley of Defilement 2.0, aka Blight Town. Now this is a similar area in the sense that there's a large open swamp area. Uh, but I think it's actually the... Hmm, I won't say necessarily the best, but it's probably actually the best swamp area in a Souls game to date. And that's also coming from someone though who liked Blight Town and who liked the Valley of Defilement. I do think this area is actually a pretty good example of a uh, well-designed level. To some extent, in the Souls way. Because right at the beginning, if you look around, you can just get a couple of uh, purple moss clumps which allow you to heal the poison that you're no doubt gonna build up. You get a couple, but you should take this as a reminder to buy some at Filing Shrine from the Handmaiden. At this point, of course, this is kind of just, you know, doing it. But when I first played the Valley of Defilement, I thought, oh no, they surely don't expect me to go through the poison. Then I finished all the other areas and I went back to the Valley of Defilement part 2 and, hmm, okay, I guess I do need to go through the poison. I ended up enjoying it more than I expected. And, of course, um, these areas always have one thing in common, aside from the swamp, it's that there's fire, and that fire guides you through the level. All you need to do is follow the flame and you will be guided to where you need to go. This level in particular can be cleared really quickly if you just, you know, do the necessary stuff. Follow the fire. But if you want to get some, some extras, particularly if you are a spellcaster, a sorcerer in particular, you might want to go through the swamp because there's a couple pyromancy tomes. Two of them, in fact. Which uh, are actually the first two pyromancy tomes that you can get in the game, so... Since the boss of this area will actually cause Orbic to leave, you will probably want to... You know, grab one of those tomes, uh, at least. And there's actually a message at the beginning of this level that tells us to extinguish the flames. This is one of those flames. And looking at that, um, that relief that's in there, it might remind you of something. Might not be immediately apparent, but it is actually, well, a depiction of a character that we already know. Alright, now we just need to do that two more times, and we can open the door to Wolf's Blood. Uh, I mentioned that Orbic leaves if you kill the boss of this area. Thing is, Orbic leaves if you kill this area's boss in particular, or four other bosses. Now, the thing with the four other bosses can only ever happen if you uh, unlock Orbic after clearing this area. Because uh, otherwise, you will fight the boss of this area before you actually, you know, beat for bosses. Because there's only three bosses after unlocking Orbic. We only beat one of them after unlocking Orbic, though, because we did kill the Crystal Sage before we actually, uh, you know, made Orbic friendly towards us. And yeah, we only need to follow the fire. Here it is again. And the area will be really short if you do that. 
On the third leg of our journey, it actually, you know, tones down on the flames a bit. But first, here's something I want to kill. This thing is evil. If you let it, it will chump you. It will pounce and just land on your head or stomp you. And if it actually does land on your head, it counts as a grab attack. And it'll just do a bit of damage. It's not too much, but it is fairly annoying if they do it several times in a row. We will be seeing that eventually, don't worry. But make sure to kill those guys as soon as you see them. Alright. So to the left here, you could go through the swamp to reach... Well, we're gonna do it eventually, but... There's three very tough enemies guarding something that's hardly worth it. Just catching a brief glimpse of them. Don't worry. We'll be fighting things like those soon enough. And here's the second flame we using extinguish already. And those guys are called Gru, by the way. This is something that we can tell from their weapons. If they drop them. Now let's check out uh, what little art we have here. It was a bit of a tree-like creature first, and here's a pile of skulls. A skeleton made of skeletons? Hmm. Do we know someone like that? Okay, yeah, it's Nito, and the tree-like creature would be the Witch of Isolith, or the Bed of Chaos as we know it. But why are the depictions there? That's something to figure out for us, I suppose. The final one would either have to be Gwyn, or the Four Kings or Seath. The Lord Soul of both of those was technically only a part of Gwyn's though, because he gave it to them as a reward for, well, the stuff they did. Alright! We are already two-thirds through the Swamp of Farron Keep. Again, this is an area that a lot of people hate, mainly because they find it disorienting and because they find the poison swamp annoying and some of the enemies, like the... those guys that I mentioned that will just, you know, grab you. Some people call them wrestling goats. I never quite understood why, because those creatures don't look very goat-like to me, but it's fair, I suppose. And up ahead we have our bonfire. Now, I don't need it technically, because... You can see by the timestamp that we're just about seven minutes into this area. But the truth is, if this is your first time through this area, despite knowing that the fire guides you, or, you know, maybe you don't even consciously know it, but despite the game guiding you there, you might feel inclined to explore. Because what I do in video games, I usually go towards the place that is least likely to mean progress first, to, you know, find hidden stuff and optional things and whatnot. But I'm sure many people do that, actually. So this bonfire was, uh, on my first run through here, very welcome. Nowadays, I just do it by going through the area, uh, unlocking the bonfire, and then I just go to the part of the swamp that interests me. Which sometimes is not even one part, because there's nothing truly essential down there, but some stuff that you might like, you know. Some neat things down there, and up ahead is actually this door that we're trying to open by extinguishing the flames and... Well, not just that, but... By extinguishing those flames, those sconces will be lit. And I know the word sconce only because I played Dark Souls 2. And I'm honestly not even sure it's a real word, but I would assume so. Well, technically everything's a real word by virtue of coming out of a mouth and having meaning, but... You know what I mean, right? Ah, this bit is a very rewarding because it gives you an undead bone shard. And the really important treasure is not even hidden in the swamp. The game's that nice to you. Being in the swamp is more of a psychological warfare, if you will. Because the poison isn't that bad. But many people will feel a rush to go through it and will be afraid to fight there because they will constantly have their health drained once the poison has built up. And look at that, here's fire. Fire guiding us. And up ahead is a very, um, annoying enemy. We will be learning more about that once you get up close. 
And this uh, muck here is actually slowing us down. So what I brought as a weapon are the uh, Brigand Twin Daggers. Uh, most dagger type weapons have a unique ability. Well, it's not unique because all of them have it, or most of them. It's called Quick Step, and it allows you to just go through the muck really quickly. You could do the same thing by rolling, but this is even quicker. And you can do it even if um, if you're out of focus points. You just won't have as many invincibility frames as far as I'm aware. And since we actually do get invaded by someone... It's an NPC though. Unfortunately for this area, I accidentally played offline. Because there, this is actually the area for a fairly major PvP covenant that guards this area. The Watchdogs of Farron. And, yeah, I didn't mean to be offline for this. Unfortunately, I only noticed afterwards. But oh well. Gotta deal with that. It's not too interesting. It would just be phantoms that are blue that attack you. Which could also be attacked by red phantoms because reds and blues are hostile to each other. And there's actually several types of blue phantoms in the game. Um, we'll be learning more about that. But the blue sentinels that we have unlocked are also blue phantoms. And those could also, as far as I'm aware, attack the watchdogs of Farron. At this point, I'm basically just trying to find a way around this big enemy because they uh, they don't usually aggro. Well, they aggro, but they don't aggro as easily. And I honestly don't know why the invader has spawned, or I didn't know. So hopefully that won't be a problem all of a sudden. Right, just walking around here seems to be usually the uh, best way to actually deal with, you know, those big guys. Now I can't tell but wonder where that waiter is. Now I know where he spawns, so it's kind of hard for me to figure out how he actually got here. Because he just does have to spawn a, a small bit away from here. Sure, he's gonna just backstab us any second now. If all else fails, we'll move on though. Ah, one of those guys saw us. Uh, wait. And every time they hit the ground, um, they will spawn projectiles. Which makes it very annoying, because every time you hit them, what you need to do is just dodge again afterwards, so you can't just safely hit them after dodging. Which is something that you usually can do. I understand it mixes up uh, the way you have to fight this opponent, but it makes him some pretty hard sometimes, because he has a lot of health. And having to deal with the protect health in addition to his very powerful attacks, it, it just, yeah, it can do stuff to you. Very bad stuff. And right here, the poison nearly killed me. This usually isn't an issue. I could have healed uh, at any time throughout that fight if I felt like it. Those have way too many, uh, too much health. Now, let's see. Yeah, it's the Four Kings from the looks of it. Which makes sense because this place too is linked to the Abyss, much like the Four Kings, which we fought in the Abyss. Well, let's actually put out that flame. After that, we could technically just move to the boss, but we won't. We'll do something a little optional here that doesn't require us to go through the swamp. And next time, we're gonna go through the swamp. And then we're gonna go to the boss. Uh, look at that! Our invader friend showed up. 
Uh, he actually came through from the other side, because if you go through that little uh, doorway, um, you know, past this uh, flame that we just extinguished, we would reach a different part of the swamp, and that's where that guy hangs out usually. Which is why I was confused that he actually invaded us, you know, way, way away from here. Normally it's a bit closer, but I guess, and this kind of never really occurred to me, maybe they just want you to feel unsafe as you go through the swamp. Uh, this guy is yellowfing a high cell, and he uses a high cell pick, that's his weapon, and he uses the yellow king set, that's what it's called, I think, the Santa set, sorry. And of course he is a mage, which means he is very versatile and very annoying. Guess he will just try to get away from you as best as he can, a lot of the time. And stay at a range, and possibly you walk right into a mob of enemies. And what I'm doing now uh, can best be described as not playing very well. But once he switches back to a melee weapon, uh, a fight should be a bit more easy. Unless... Oh well. Shit happens. Alright. So... I don't really want to go back to where we fought him. In fact, I don't really want him to invade us again. Just there's this item here. Ah, we forgot. Figured I might as well pick it up. In case you lost your bearings, this is actually fairly close to the one uh, abandoned tower where we found the uh, undead bone ash. And now we're actually gonna go up here. This bit is strictly optional. You don't need to come here ever, but. There's one thing in particular that I want so desperately up there. We'll be seeing what I mean, and you will understand, especially for me up in this game, what it means. The Souls games sure like their long ladders. I'm not sure which one's the longest, but this isn't it. So before we go inside, let's actually look around this area, because uh, from up here you can actually see the towers with the flames. And now they are not on fire anymore, mainly because we've already put them out. But you can see them. And if you can't find one of the flames for some reason, just, you know, go up here and look. And yeah, we just did open up an illusory wall, and in here is actually the thing that I want. The dream chases ashes. It's one of the few sets of ashes that actually have unique dialogue if you give it to the Handmaiden. And this uh, wolf, which is presumably dead, um, is actually the covenant leader of the uh, Watchdogs of Farron. So now we too could invade people who just come to this area to go through the game. And let's actually give those ashes to the Handmaiden. Because again, it's uh, the only set of ashes that Ash gives you unique dialogue if you give it to her. Aside from ashes of somebody you just killed. And another set of ashes we haven't given to the Handmaid yet are the Paladin's Ashes. Which appear to be Paladin Leroy's Ashes, because... Well, he's the one Paladin that we knew was a Paladin, and we get some items linked to the Way of White out of it. Which, you know, was Leroy's religion. Gracious, passing fine ash thou hast given. Let this ash be stone nourishment. I only hope these new wares content thee. <laughs> Ashen one, what woeful umbral ash is this? This barren dust stuff of a fool won't yield aught. Where didst thou happen upon the stuff? Tell me for the sport. Oh yes, I see. Clinging to lofty dreams in this dying world, more's the pity. It must come from one most foolish indeed. Wouldst thou not agree? <laughs> oh, 
Alright, now we can actually purchase Titanite Shards. Which will make upgrading weapons for this LP so much easier. Sure? Believe me. Though this is also just around the point where the game wants you to have a weapon higher than just plus 3, which is all you can make with Titanite Shards. I normally have a plus 4 or 5 weapon here, to be honest, because you do find some large Titanite along the way. But it's balanced so you can just, you know, relatively easily go around with just a plus 3 weapon and do your thing. And since we found the uh, undead bone shard, let's just use this one. Well. well, that's not all there is to this place. Because there's this fairly, you know, big elevator. And what's up there is actually kind of interesting. It is a familiar place, actually. Though you might not immediately recognize it. We've technically been here before. And from here too, we can see a bunch of places that we're gonna go to. Like in there, one of those towers is actually, uh... One of those fire towers from the swamp. And the high wall of Lothric right up there. So this is actually the bridge. Or rather the, well, the, yes, the really long bridge that would lead to Castle Lothric. The thing is that it's, um, as you can see here, quite damaged. And there's a Chaos Demon patrolling around. Though it is a Chaos Demon that has lost its flame. It's a rather simple fight, to be honest. Opposed to the one that we fought together with Sigward, this one cannot use any fire-based attacks whatsoever. He does have some attacks though. Uh, he is of course very reminiscent to the Asylum Demon. And a bit to the Stray Demon I guess. Additionally you can just puke boulders at us. Which you know is nice. Something I could not show off though is that uh, if you damage his legs enough they will actually break off. And he will fight without them. But I've never actually managed to do that, I've only seen it happen on other people's footage. Aside from that again, this fight really isn't too difficult. Fairly slow swings that um, are easy to figure out the time to dodge for. And this neat attack that we've seen so many times. The fact that we have a weapon that has a lot of very quick consecutive strikes actually helps out of it here. Though you could just as well fight him with a bigger weapon, because he is slower. He will always be slower than you, no matter what. He's after all has his best days behind him already. But we do get a soul from him, the soul of a stray demon. We'll be having a look into that eventually. But yeah, this is the bridge that we actually have been on before, though we've been on a different part before. We can't reach that part, but we will soon see a bit of the bridge that we could see before from a fairly good vantage point. I wonder if you still remember. But to get there we actually have to, you know, come here. Okay, so up here is this dragon. And above the dragon you can see those two towers. And we look down from one of those to see this dragon here. And up there, uh, on the other end of the crumbled bridge, would be the tons of pilgrims. And where we found Yol. And the game really gives us a, a, quite a few large titanite shots at this point. And are uh, uh, one of the first offensive miracles that we can get, actually. The lightning spear. It works a bit different than in other games. It was just a straight up ranged miracle in other games. Here it still is ranged, but there's a bit of a damage drop off the further it travels. In fact, some say it's quite useless unless you're really up close. 
I haven't used it myself yet though, at least I haven't really uh, used it a lot, just a bit. Oh yeah, up ahead we can actually see the pilgrims. And the entrance to the undead settlement, and in fact, the undead settlement itself. Now, why we still have a little bit of time left, why don't we talk about the weapons that we brought? Aside from the uh, weapon skill, I didn't really talk about it. But this is one of the few weapons that you can actually dual wield. A dual wielding in this game works a bit differently than in Dark Souls 2. Because here's just a couple weapons and if you press, you know, the two-handing button, it will instead dual wield them. And with the L1 or left bumper triggers, you can actually do additional attacks. In this case, it's dual wielding attacks. Very quick strikes that just do a little damage on their own, but they add up quick. It's a fairly decent weapon, does fairly decent damage, as we saw as we went through this area. So there's one pilgrim actually. Kind of interesting because he's turned yellow due to being there for so long. But anyway, yeah. The uh, Brigand Twin Daggers are actually a fairly decent weapon as far as I'm concerned. I usually shy away from daggers because they're really weak. And even though they attack more quickly, the speed that they have usually doesn't really make it worth it. But dual wielding it, having very, very fast attack speed. Actually, that's that's quite good. That makes it worth it, in my opinion. But this is it for the exploration of this area today. Now, we won't be having a look into what we can make from the Stray Demon Soul right away, because we will actually be using it soon, so I won't make a separate segment for it. So, see you again next time when we go through the swamp.